All right, we're here today. Very excited. Thanks. Dr. Bill Andrews. Um, Bill, you're, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for being here, taking the time to do this. Very excited. You're very interesting on so many levels. So you're PhD in molecular biology. You're a businessman. Sierra Science is your company. You're an uh, ultra marathon runner. And then in terms of the world of longevity, you've kind of become a celebrity. You're definitely a celebrity in, in, in our world and, and the longevity community. Um, and you're an advocate for longevity. And one of the ways you're an advocate is, I mean, you're one of the people that live kind of longevity in terms of like lifestyle choices Absolutely. that you do. Um, and I know running is like one of the things that relates to that. So I just want to call like, how do you get into running? Like, when did you kind of make the switch with longevity in terms of just even yourself making lifestyle choices real, around longevity? Well, well, first, let me say, I'm excited to be here. Not just you're excited that I'm here. I'm excited that you guys are interviewing because the things you do with People Unlimited and RadFest, I think, are the most amazing things ever in the field of anti-aging and just trying to prevent declining health. Uh, and so I'm really glad to be here. Um, now, awesome. the questions that you just asked, you, uh, is there an order, like, could I start with the ultramarathon run? <laughs> start with the ultramarathon yeah, run. So, so I... Uh, First of all, ultramarathon is, what, what, what makes it, 50 running, miles right? or more? Anything, the definition is anything longer than a marathon. Okay. I've typically said to myself, 50K is only like five miles longer than a marathon, so I don't normally count 50Ks as ultramarathons. So I my, my, I I say 50 milers and 100 milers and longer are ultra marathons. Wow. What's the longest one you've ever done? 138 miles at 18,000 feet elevation in the Himalayas of northern India. And that was nonstop. Oh, my God. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, we saw that on that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you did like a but the, uh, filmed it. I, you know, I've been running my whole life. I, I, it's like I was, uh, my parents weren't the kind of parents that said quit running around the pool. When I'd run around the pool, they never told me to stop, okay? Uh, I was just running everywhere. When I was 10 years old, my father entered us into a race, me and my twin, I've got an identical twin brother. He oh, and wow. I were both running everywhere. The, he entered us into a race at this Los Angeles Athletic Club. And it was on an indoor track that was 10th of a mile around. And me and about 20 other kids and, and my brother were all lining up at the starting line to compete in this race. <clears throat> um, we were terrified. I mean, it's like a whole mile. That was like <laughs> unbelievable. We were 10 years old at the time. Um, but when the race was over, my twin brother and I tied for first and lapped third place twice. Okay. Wow. And so we suddenly knew, hey, Jeez. we're endurance runners. Yeah, right? you knew it. Uh, and, uh, but I, you know, people knew me and my brother in high school. When, whenever we went from one class to another, we ran. When we were at a private uh, boarding school and when like uh, meals were done, and we, we ran back to our dormitory where everybody else was walking. It's, it's like, right. of course, we also competed in cross country and track in, in high school and college. Um, uh, I, wow. I just, I just kept much your going. Whole life. Yeah, and then so I decided to move up to marathons uh, in my uh, late 20s. Uh, <clears throat> and so I just did a lot of marathons in uh, my late 20s and 30s. And then I moved up to ultra marathons in my early 40s. So that's about 20, 21, 22 years ago now. It's my first ultra marathon. And it's like ultra marathons are the greatest things on the planet. I just love them because they're so <laughs> adventurous. Uh, they don't, they're not as fast as marathons. You know, typically I run a marathon and oh, I'm dead afterwards. Right. Because you know, it's a sprint. Whereas an ultra marathon, I just start off slow. I just enjoy myself, enjoy the scenery, talk to people, other runners. Uh, and then maybe maybe 10, 20 miles into the race, I'll say, okay, well, let me see if I can pick up the speed, you know, it, depending on how I feel. And so I play it that way. I, I have no idea how I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm running a 50-mile race tomorrow here in Scottsdale. At the, it's called the McDowell Mountain Frenzy. It's mm -hmm. a 50-mile. I'm going go to the, run to the top of Thompson's Peak over here. Right. Uh, of course, I'm going to walk up that hill because it's like this. Uh, I've been up it before and had to use my hands uh, a lot right. of places. But uh, it's... Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, do wow. that race. I have no idea. I'm just going to go out and have fun. The, the, you know, people say sometimes uh, in races, to finish is to win. Mm -hmm. okay, just to right, finish right, it means yeah, winning. Yeah. My, my definition is to start is to win. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I'm, I'm just 
my number one goal is to get started. Yeah. Okay, to be there. Okay, so being there is more important than anything else. And so I don't, I'm not, when a 50, 100 mile race, you just don't even think about the finish line. Yeah. You just think about, oh, what great sights am I gonna see? And what great adventures and yeah, things yeah. like that. And, and then towards the end, then you start saying, okay, well, let's, let's see how, what time I can get. Yeah. And so, but that's been my whole life. And I, I got so addicted to ultra marathons right off the bat that my very first year, I broke the world record for the most 100 mile races ever run by one person. Yeah, you're oh, wow. like an elite athlete. Wow. Well, I've never did. won a race. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm, there's, there's elite, <laughs> people beat me all the time. I win my, you know, I win my age group now every single time. I mean, it's like nobody competes against wow. me in my right. age group. Yeah. And that, that goes for 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, half marathons, uh, 100 mile races, 50 mile races, all, all that. So it's, uh, and finding out the older you get, the easier it gets. In fact, I yeah. qualify for Boston now every single time I yeah. run, a, run a marathon. Um, wow. But uh, it, it's, but I've never done Boston yeah. because I don't want to travel that far for just a marathon. Yeah. But right, I'll go that right. far all over the world for an ultra marathon. Uh, so I'm addicted. I'm I've run over a hundred ultras now. Uh, over a hundred. Yeah. Jeez. And only counting the fifty wow. milers and above. Uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, just very and, exciting. And no slowing down. I mean, well, with the, the truth is, January, last January, I ended up getting uh, some pain in my arm, a reticulopathy, something like that. They, they, they found that I had a bulge disc in my neck. Oh, wow. And uh, so, you know, they were saying surgery, I wasn't going to be able to turn my neck anymore and stuff like that. But my, I decided to do the physical therapy route. But as a result of that bulge disc, I have not run an ultra marathon in a year. Okay. Now. Okay. So oh, wow. tomorrow will be my See first ultra marathon. Yes, yeah, my comeback. But oh, I've run. Wow. I did a marathon three weeks ago. Just finished it without any trouble at all. Yeah. Uh, and just re knew I could do another one right off the spat. Yeah. Uh, and I've I've just uh, set my, ran my fastest 10k in 25 years just on Thanksgiving Day just a, a week ago. I love it. Uh, yeah. So it's. Uh, what else are you doing related to health? And it's kind of interesting to me, first of all, because you started doing, mar I thought you started doing these long distance running because it lengthened your telomeres or helped with telomeres, which turned out to be just a it turns happy out coincidence to be true. for yeah, you, right? Yeah, exactly. That's in your field. <laughs> totally. I, what, I, was, I really just made that connection in my brain that that's why you did that. that I actually started. believe that what I was doing was shortening my telomeres. But, right. You know, hey, right. what's the point of living if you're not living? Well, you I know? want to ask you about that because I know with, and I've heard you advocate this with running is not to be doing it in a way that you're destroying your body. Yeah. I, I've like I work with a lot of runners who come to my clinic, mm -hmm. and and you see a lot, of, especially a lot of the elite ones who are competing to win races. I mean, it's and this is in almost any professional sport. They just are well, destroying know, their bodies. I know a lot of runners that win these races, but they do it fun. I mean, um, Jim Walmsley. He's he's like one of the greatest runners of all time. He just slaughtered the. Uh, record for the Western States 100 mile race and he did it smiling and mm -hmm. crossed the finish line dancing. Right. It, it, it's like uh, that. See, wow. he's just he's just got good genetics mm -hmm. and he's I, or I'm sure he's done a lot more than just his genetics. Yeah. Uh, but some of us don't, don't have that great of genetics. We have to focus mm -hmm. on a different way of doing it. But my models are, you know, keep it keep it uh, fun. OK, mm -hmm. if it's not fun, it's actually hurting you. OK, right. it's causing too much stress on your body. Uh, I also believe that when it stops being fun, quit. Right. Okay. And and save it for another day. There's nothing wrong with quitting a race. Uh, you know, especially if you think you're going to do another race afterwards. Um, so I, so it's, it's it's when it quits being fun, quit. And also just have fun. You know, right. it's uh, and and if it even a, like one thing you don't do in a marathon very often is walk. Okay. Uh, People just frown on that. But in an ultra marathon, everybody, even the winners, walk yeah. some of it. Right. Okay, <clears throat> so so the, yeah, I, I was going to ask you about that. How long does it usually take for an ultra to run an uh, ultra marathon? Well, first let me say, the, the, like a hundred mile. What I always say is, is if it becomes a struggle, walk. Okay. Okay. And then when when you feel like running again, then start running. Right. But, yeah. but it's it's like it takes me twenty to twenty four hours typically. Okay. On a, depends on the course, but sometimes it takes me. 35 hours, okay, when it's really going over big mountains and things like that, right, which are yeah. my favorites. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but uh, I, I, the world record, I think, is 13 hours, something like that, for 100 miles, and I think that was done on a track. Oh, wow. I, I can't mm -hmm. do that. I've, I've tried races 
there are loops. Yeah. There's not enough adventure in it yeah, to keep me going. Like right. pretty, and I, the longest I've ever been able to make it is 60 <laughs> miles. And I just say, forget it. Yeah. You know, I gotta get too bored. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> what else are you, like, what else do you do? Like, what other switches have you made for, like, your health and longevity? Well, just <clears throat> reducing inflammation is the biggest thing you want to do. And that's why, so one of the things I believe is that uh, running, keeping running fun is a way of actually reducing inflammation. Whereas right. when you stress it, you increase inflammation. And inflammation does everything. And when you're talking aging. inflammation, you're talking about kind of global inflammation in the global, body, not yes. the... Mostly the cardiovascular system. Right. Uh, and, and it's like, uh, it, it's, it's just, it, it's, inflammation just causes aging everywhere. Right. Uh, the, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, So what are common say, triggers that people have for inflammation? Because I know it can be related to stress, the foods yeah. we eat. Foods, food, yeah, so. Lack so, of sleep. So let me, because <laughs> I, I went blank there for a second. But uh, so, so, so the th a lot of the things that I do include diet and lifestyle. Okay, so like, I, I'm a vegan. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask I you about that actually. I, I I never wanted to be a vegan. I, I don't have anything against things that have faces or <laughs> mothers, right. you know, right. which the normal vegan thing. But I just always knew that that uh, vegan health lifestyle, health if diet was much better for you, a lot, lot less inflammatory. But you know, I used to always get on stage and show pictures of old people that were 65, and I say, when I turn 65, I want to look like this, and I show mm -hmm. pictures of young people. Mm -hmm. Well, then, what, two years ago, I turned 65. <laughs> okay, and I can't say that anymore, but six, turning 65 was the day I decided to become vegan. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I, not just vegan, but I also quit all oils. Okay, so, so. All oils. All oils. No yeah. olive oil, no avocado oil, nothing. Nothing, no canola wow. oil. Uh, wow. So what was the, what's the thinking behind that? Uh, because, there's really not a lot of good data saying that oil is good for you. It's actually bad for you. Um, there are, like, there's a Dr. Caldwell, Caldwell Esselstyn uh, who's written a book and he's actually published a lot of papers showing that oils actually can cause cardiovascular disease. I mean, people think of cardiovascular disease as just your coronary arteries, for instance, and uh, lifestyle, bad lifestyle choices, bad diet can actually cause your coronary arteries to, to clog up. Um, but people forget that there's other arteries in your heart too called collateral arteries. And those are like, for every coronary artery, there's 10,000 collateral arteries. And oils cause those collateral arteries to constrict. Okay, and so oh, wow. don't, those don't get any blood to the heart. So you, you get much better uh, circulation of blood through your heart and stuff like that by not eating oils. Now, it's not all oils. I do eat, and this is gonna be, vegans would say I'm, I'm breaking the <laughs> rules breaking when the I rules. say this one. I do take omega-3 fatty, fatty acids, acids from okay. fish. Right. Okay. And I, but I, I was going to ask you how you're supplementing that, so yeah. that's good to know. Okay. Yeah. And it's like I said, I don't, I don't care if they have a face or a mother. It, it's like I'm just trying to find out the best healthy diet, and and you need omega-3 fatty so acids. Take that every and, day, then. And some omega. Yep. Yeah, I take it. I take a lot of it every day. Yeah. Um, but the, the, so and I do a lot of things to in to decrease inflammation. Um, like vitamin D, and uh, I, I take more supplements than I How, many, how much admit. vitamin C, like 10,000 IU a day? Uh, I think I take a lot more than that. I, really? I, I haven't, I don't remember, I can dig it up and find out, but I take this big scoop of powder and mix it in water every morning and every night, okay? And then, then on top of that, I eat two yellow bell peppers every day, okay? And the reason Why the I the yellow pick, ones? The yellow ones have more vitamin C than anything else. And bell wow. peppers have the lowest amount of sugar of any fruit, okay? And so <clears throat> sugar is also inflammatory. So I love I that we getting these like body hacks from Bill. This is great. You, so you, is <laughs> sugar inflammatory even if you don't have a condition? Yeah, sugar is, sugar is one of the worst Because I always wanted for. to know that because people are always saying, oh, so well, you're you feeling cancer, with inflammation. don't eat sugar, you get this, don't eat sugar. But I just want to know in general, do you think it's inflammatory, period? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. It's one of the most inflammatory things we can eat. Um, but what about like when you're running and doing those things? Like I mean, you must have to consume some mass. I do. I do eat. I try to eat complex carbs, but I like you know, fruits. No, like uh, multidextrin, um, which are long chains of of amino of, of sugar molecules. Um, but they so you break, don't eat fruit. They not not during ultra marathon. Right. I mean, I but you eat fruit. Daily. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I try to reduce it because the large amounts of sugar in fruits. Except what do you think that's about why blueberries? I go with bell peppers. Blueberries are are uh, 
a lot of sugar in them, but they're they're good for you for the antioxidants right, and stuff like yeah. that. Uh, so I mean, I every morning kind I kind of like coffee. It's got the good and the bad a little bit, right? Every morning <laughs> I have yeah. It was like I can come up with a lot of analogies to that kind of logic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in fact, like uh, was it uh, you know flying versus driving across country? <laughs> Some people are afraid of planes, but they, so they, they drive, which is a thousand times more dangerous than flying. Right. Okay, and then uh, self-driving cars, everybody's worried about self-driving cars making mistakes and causing accidents. Right. But the, the, right now, they're so sophisticated that the accident rate is going to be way below. Right. Totally. And so it's like... Yeah, they killed that here in Arizona, you know, because one, pe one ped got hit by one yeah. of the self-driving cars. So f they, they totally killed it here. Like they should have killed the, the research. non self driving and I cars many, because I said, about you know how many thousand people, regular, yes. you know how many regular drivers kill pedestrians all the time? Yeah. It's so just one little, you know, it's like, of course there's going to be mistakes in any technology in the beginning. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got me off track, but... Yeah, go like ahead. The, uh, uh, but I do avoid fruits a lot, uh, okay. and that's why, but yellow bell peppers are the exception. I think okay. you need to have some fruits and, and uh, the vitamin C and... Is we should important. be taking notes. There, there's also <laughs> you are going to be watching. Yes. Uh, there, Craig, now, I want to do it, want to do it now. No. If you go to a lot of like <laughs> conferences and stuff like that, you hear a lot of people say that vitamin C is only good if you get it from the fruit. If you if you buy powders or drinks and stuff like yeah, that, I've heard that, that's yeah. not real vitamin C, and it's it doesn't do everything that that uh, the uh, vegetable or the fruits do. So I I in addition to the powder, I do the two yellow bell peppers just to cover all bases. But I I. I go through a lot of vitamin C a day, um, and uh, uh, you know. What about the raw vitamin C? Okay, like what do you mean the raw? The raw, food, you know, they they sell it in capsules, but it's raw. It's from it's food base. No, oh, I've never heard of it. I don't even yeah, know what yeah. that is. I, I use that a lot. The guard, that Garden of Life company makes it. Oh, well, see, I'm a big fan of Garden of Life. So yeah, send me something about okay, that. Okay, yeah, I'll try sure. it out. Yeah, yeah, I do it in the B form and in the C form. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. So I've, your thoughts with, with inflammation, life. though, but in general, just like, is there like a safe amount of inflammation, or you're just like the lower the better, and that's no, why you no, you can't. There, infl it's like you have to have some inflammation, right? Because inflammation is there to protect right. you, right? Right. Okay? Yeah, exactly. It's part of your it's immune just, system. The, oh, yeah. Yes, the over it's overdoing it. So you don't want to shut it completely down. Uh, you just want to, you know, modulate it a bit. Right. Uh, same with like oxidative stress. You don't want to. You don't want to take too many antioxidants to shut down free radicals because, like, there's immune cells like uh, macrophages. Right. When they find an invading bacteria, they shoot a machine gun <laughs> at the mm -hmm. bacteria that are free radicals. Right. Okay. It's like you, you you don't want to mess that up. So so th there's there is such a thing as too low and too high, and that's almost true for everything. I always like to think of like on a car. You know, on one of the gauges on a car, there's uh, oil pressure. Okay. There's too low. There's Right. It's red, green is perfect, and then there's too high, which is red. I mean, everything's like that. There's too low and too high of just about everything. So um, it's, it's, you've got to somehow figure out the best balance. Right. Um, and you're pretty diligent about blood work. I mean, how often are you testing those types of things? Well, okay, so that's another thing is I, well, I get blood work every six months to just make certain that my normal blood work mm -hmm. is okay. But I also do uh, blood work to test for foods and medicines and other things that cause inflammation in me. So Everybody's food sensitivities, different. food, yes. yeah. Okay. And it, 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 the company I use is called Alcat, A-L-C-A-T. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and, you know, every six months, it costs $1,000. I send them $1,000. They send me a kit. I take it to the phlebotomist, get some blood drawn. They send me back uh, results showing what foods I'm sensitive to, what I'm not sensitive to. And I don't eat the food that I'm sensitive to. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, well, you like stay off it for like three months, six months, or how do you usually do uh, until it says I can. I mean, oh, okay. So, so, so sometimes a year. Every, okay. Yeah. So oh, wow. Okay. And, and blueberries was on that list for. Oh, it was a year ago. Yeah. So I've just gotten back onto blueberries, but like every morning, my my breakfast is oatmeal. Okay, uh, gluten free oatmeal that I get from Whole Foods. I typically do one cup of oatmeal, and then with water, and then I use unsweetened soy milk. But I mix it with, with blackberries and blueberries and raspberries. Sounds like what I do. Okay. I do that Garden of Life uh, vanilla protein. I've had that. Uh, yeah, pea fact, protein. I had it at Radfest. Yeah, yeah. I do that with blueberries and hemp milk, unsweetened hemp milk every morning. Yeah. So the, so, um, but, but I, for, for almost a year, I couldn't do blueberries. 
Oh, wow. And okay. then my last test that I was okay, that I wasn't sensitive to blueberries anymore. But my worry is that now that I'm eating blueberries again, I'm going to go back to being sensitive to it. But, right, right. But that's why I get the blood yeah. work done all the time, yeah. just to keep track of that kind of stuff. Um, wow. Let's see. And, you know, I, I like to get my um, CRP, the C-reactive protein, measured uh, routinely in, so like at least every six months. A lot of time, like ultra marathons, like two to three days after an ultra marathon, I always get my CRP measured. My doctor actually has written out uh, slips for me to take to the uh, right. lab testing, and I just got a stack of them. I can take them anytime. He's already signed them and stuff like that. So if I want to see if I've done anything to cause my C reactor protein right. to go up, I just go and get wow. the blood work. But and if it had gone up, that'd be indicative of you maybe overdoing it. Yeah, or, that, yeah. that would be inflammation. I, I'm, Happy to say that's great that, that you do it after the race. That's like yeah. a, a good way to safe test that you're doing that in a self in a yeah, safe hold range. On, hold on. It's like normally my CRP is in undetectable, okay, because they, they can't detect between 0.2 and 0.3, below 0.2 or 0.3, depending on which CRP test you're doing. Uh, and I'm always below that level. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, sometimes when I run ultra marathons, my CRP might get up to two, which is still considered safe, okay, but it goes right back down again. So. Right, right. So, let's. What's new with your research? Well, with still, still, the priority is this gene therapy. Um, okay. Okay. So I had mentioned at uh, Radfest. Well, at the previous Radfest, I had met a guy named Jeff Mathis, who licensed our gene therapy from us, uh, and he's he's developed a company called Labella Gene Therapeutics, and I'm. I'm way more involved than I sh probably should be because I just want to, I, I can't wait for the study again. I, I want to make certain it's done right too. I don't, I want to, I want to make certain that nobody cuts any corners. Right. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. and plus the producing the gene therapy is so expensive that it would be ridiculous to treat somebody and not get every bit of data possible. Right. So that has been consuming a lot of my time trying to figure out, okay, when the patient shows up, who's going to draw the blood? What kind of tubes is the blood going to go into? Who are the tubes going to be sent to? Who's going to be doing the studies, the at tests? My lab's going to be doing some of this test that we, you know, we couldn't find elsewhere, uh, but we're sending uh, tubes everywhere. We've had to bring in experts in the field that are involved in that, like uh, uh, Dr. Sandra Kaufman, who's speaking at uh, People Unlimited today. She's, she's on board with us. She's, she's been uh, doing a superb job of I identifying the list of biomarkers that we should be testing for looking at aging, even though the clinical study is focused on Alzheimer's. <laughs> it would be dumb to do this study and not check the blood markers right. and stuff like that for oh, aging yeah. too. Wow. So we, we've got all these things built into it. <clears throat> uh, we just finalized the list pretty much on uh, yesterday. Uh, and uh, it's been a long ordeal that I think. So just back up for one second, explain to us what gene therapy is, okay. and then what you're actually doing this gene therapy for. Okay, gene therapy is taking a gene and putting that gene into your cells, okay? Like G a virus. Well, vi a virus is one of the mechanisms, but it's oh. not the only mechanism. <clears throat> so there's, there's different ways of delivering a gene to a cell. In our case, we are using a, we, I, I can't say we're using a virus, okay? Mm -hmm. We are using the mechanisms that a virus uses, okay? Oh. So, so we, okay. The, the thing that makes a virus danger, dangerous is its payload, okay? In a virus, there's always genes, and those genes are toxic, okay? And the gene gets put into the cell, and that, that causes harm to that cell. That's what all viruses, that's the way all, all viruses work. Well, we are, you know, so we got this, it's called a capsid, but inside of our capsid is the gene for telomerase, okay? There's no virus genes at all there. The only thing that, that's similar to a virus is the mechanism, the pr surface, things on the surface that allow that virus to get into the cell, except uh, here I'm calling it a virus. I, I prefer mm -hmm. to call it a gene therapy. Yeah, yeah, um, <clears throat> but the, uh, and I don't like using the word infection <laughs> right, either right, because yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's too, indicative of, or right. suggestive of, of disease. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so it's a gene therapy. So I, at RADFEST, I compared it to soap bubbles, okay? Mm -hmm. So a human cell is like a big soap bubble, and the gene therapy is like a small soap bubble, and imagine they're floating oh, in the air. Closer. Yeah, yeah, we're getting some outside disturbance. 
So, so imagine two soap bubbles floating in the air. When they come into each other, contact with each other, every kid who's ever blown knows right. that they, they fuse, okay? Run, magically fuse. Well, that's what happens essentially with gene therapy too. So we are pumping gene therapy, these little soap bubbles, into the person's blood. And we're also putting it in, a, in the cerebral spinal fluid too, so, so an inner fecal uh, injection. We're putting these into the person with the idea that these are going to go find human cells and fuse with them and insert the gene into the cell. And then when that happens, the gene has already been engineered by us, so it produces a lot of telomerase. Okay? So it gets in the cells, it produces a lot of telomerase. And in, in vitro, when we do this in vitro, we produce 30 times as much telomerase as we need to actually prevent, prevent telomer shortening, and the, the telomeres actually get longer. Wow. So, so this gene therapy is very powerful, and it has worked uh, in mice. Uh, other labs like uh, Maria Blasco's lab, uh, Rhonda Pinnell's lab have used gene therapy techniques like this to introduce telomerase, and they do get lengthening of telomeres. Now, I'm the first person who always says, humans aren't mice, right. we're very different, so we don't know anything about uh, uh, humans until we actually try it. Uh, we, we, I was working for a while, I think I mentioned this at the previous RADFest, I, w I was working on a while trying to get an animal study done with a primate called Madame Bertha's mouse lemur. <coughs> uh, I picked that one because it's the smallest primate there is, and it's only the size of a human thumb. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a close relation to us, and I just want to get wow. some, some of their cells and make certain that they do age by telomere shortening and do have, right. do have telomerase shut off in all their cells. And if that's the case, then, then that would be a good animal study to do. But Labella came along and, and said that um, <clears throat> they already had approval from uh, FDA and others that uh, other uh, third-party animal studies were sufficient. So, so when are you guys hoping to wow. start with the human our first, trial? And that's happening here in the U.S.? Yeah. Our, well, it's going to be, it's partly in the U.S., but... Uh, um, the, there's this new program called RMAT, R-M-A-T, through the FDA, uh, <clears throat> which is specifically for gene therapy type of things that allows us to test it on five different people, uh, up to five people. Uh, and we, we are talking about possibly, but we don't have to do it in the United States. So, so the, we, we've been looking for hospitals that right. would, uh, but all over the world, okay? Uh, and the latest number one choice right now is a hospital in Dubai, okay, uh, that is very interested in. There's hospitals fighting over right. who gets to be the ones to do these clinical studies. But we are gonna probably do a lot of the pre and post testing uh, in uh, Florida, okay? So uh, uh, a combination of uh, Dr. Sandra Kaufman's lab and another lab in Orlando that were, that uh, I shouldn't mention their names because we haven't signed a deal with them yet, but they're very interested in in participating in this clinical study, uh, and then, and then after they get the pre pre test done, they're flown to maybe Dubai, could be Colombia, could be uh, South Korea, could be Japan, uh, Vanuatu Island. Right. Uh, there, these are all the places that we've already been uh, having contact, and it's like, it's like, they're all trying to be first. <laughs> okay, so right. so, but uh, uh, last I heard. And, and when I say we, it's not really my company that's doing it. Mm -hmm. It's Labella Gene Therapeutics. Right. So the choice of where it's going to be done is totally their choice. But last I heard, uh, Dubai is looking like it's got the, right. the lead. Uh, and what is the candidate? What is the candidates for this? Well, the candidate, the, the first, so, so as I said, the gene therapy is very expensive, and it also takes like six weeks to produce enough to treat one person. Oh, wow. Uh, and when you say very expensive? Three million dollars. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, and I mean, if it became on the, if it got on the market, it's going to be more than that. But that's pretty much the total cost of doing this study on one person is going to be about three million dollars. Uh, and so, um, <clears throat> because of the cost and because of the time it takes to produce the gene therapy, only one patient can be treated about every six weeks at the most. Okay. And the first patient is scheduled for uh, mid January. Uh, I think at Radfest I said it was going to be December, but. Uh, there's, because of all these different things we got to juggle, it just keeps getting delayed and delayed. And I, I, well, I per personally wouldn't be surprised if it gets delayed even further. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> but because I, I don't want to do it if we're not doing it right. Okay, and that's the right. key thing. 
Um, but the first patient is somebody who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's five and a half to six years ago. Okay. Uh, and uh, he's, I'm hoping that we save him, okay? Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm very opposed to doing a clinical study on somebody and you don't really care about the person. You know, mm -hmm. I want to yeah, make sure right. this person yeah, benefits him. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and, and also, I'm just hoping the side effects are going to be that he shows a lot of uh, uh, ways of getting younger. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's a pretty cool side effect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, that's. What's the that's connection at? with Alzheimer's? I mean, why does this, why, why would you expect <clears throat> this is going to. Well, there's always been a correlation effect. between telomere length and Alzheimer's disease. Okay. There's many publications that have been published uh, showing that people who have Alzheimer's have shorter telomeres than people that don't. So that's kind of suggestive that there might be mm. an effect, but who knows, cause and effect. Is, is Alzheimer's causing that telomere shortening or the telomere shortening causing, causing Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's yeah. or contributing to the cause of Alzheimer's? Uh, the, uh, then Ro Dr. Rhonda Pinnell did his mouse study and he showed that it had a remarkable reversal in the aging process that he said, including brain size getting bigger, some brain functions coming back. Uh, and, and it kind of like made me and others, I've heard other people say the same thing at conferences, is Alzheimer's the loss of memory or the loss of access to the memory? And mm. so it might be that lengthening telomeres restores the access to the memory that's been there all along. Okay, so, oh, wow. so who knows? I mean, this is what, yeah, yeah. This is what clinical studies right. are for, to find right, out to the find answers. Out. And yeah. is there potentially even just different types of Alzheimer's that people get and oh, they're yeah. just all being clumped in this section because... I mean, it's like so hard to define Alzheimer's yeah. that you can't even do it until a person dies, but, but every case is different. And, you know, I know you might be aware that my father and my younger brother both passed away three months apart from each other from oh, Alzheimer's. I know. Sorry. This was I like three that. years ago. Yeah, yep. no, it's, it was right after The Immortalist came out. My yeah. father was in The Immortalist. Yeah, I knew that, yeah. And, you know, when we they first that. started filming, he had no sign of Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, and then during the filming, later in the filming, he started showing signs of Alzheimer's, and, it was and then quick. he passed away a few years later. Yeah. And then my younger brother developed it uh, at the same time. He passed away three months before my father. My father went to wow. my brother's funeral and had no idea what was going on. Okay, so <clears throat> this is, this is, I call the disease worse than death. Okay, it's yeah, not just bad for the patient, horrible, it's worse right. for all their for family. For everybody involved, like yeah. Yeah, so, so I forget the question now. But <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, with the connection with Alzheimer's and telomere length, but I, it does. Yeah. So uh, the thought is that if you can lengthen the, tear, the telomeres, it might, that it, it might have a reversing effect on, yeah. on yeah. that. And, or it might stop the progression of it. Right. We, don't, we don't know. It's, it's the kind of things we're going to find out. Right, right, That's right. the purpose of the study. So a lot of the tests we're doing are cognitive studies. Tests. So how related is, is what you're doing to the CRISPR thing? CRISPR is a completely unrelated, CRISPR is gene editing. Yeah, because that's what I wanted, because people ask that question a lot, so I wanted you to, because I thought you would be a good person to. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very interested in, in CRISPR, but. To, 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 to be able to make, to show the difference. Let me, let me rephrase my, what I just said. Okay. I'm very interested in gene editing. Gene okay? editing, okay. But CRISPR is more of a marketing thing than than you, than you realize, okay? okay because that's what I gene, to know. gene yeah. editing has been around for a long time. Right. We've that's been what doing, I thought. We've yeah. been doing gene editing since uh, the early 2000s. Uh, in fact, in 1997, the first gene editing company, a company called Sangamo, uh, that uses what's called zinc finger gene editing, uh, I, we were going to share a company, lab space together, to start you know, founding our own company. So I was very interested in gene therapy. But I didn't because my investors wanted me to go elsewhere. But <clears throat> the, uh, but we did do a lot of gene therapy with the technique of zinc fingers and accomplished a lot of stuff. And we, anything that CRISPR can do now, we were doing 20 years ago. Then, then another approach came out called Talons, T-A-L-E-N-S. Okay, and so that was working, and everybody, lots of people are getting data. That and then CRISPR came out, and then somehow the marketers all made it sound like. Nobody's ever done this before. Right, right. <laughs> Us people are saying, this thing, "What's going on here?" But it's but so so. It's I'm, great though, even in that world. I can't that see. things get warped and yeah, right. Well, know, marketed and perceived in a certain like way. Just like anything, the and then problem, they they pitch it to the general public, and it's but, different. But the big problem is just like my, with my research, everything depends on the funding. 
Right. And so you got to do what you got to do to get funding. And that's what CRISPR is trying. They're trying to get funding by promoting this as a whole new revolution and right. things. And it's, it's not really, but you know, if it helps, it helps. I, I, I tried to get the president of Sangamo to speak at Radfest last year. And <clears throat> when I was telling him, you got to get up there and explain what, what, what you're doing that's the same as CRISPR. And he says, no, nah, we just want to stay out of the, there's no, stay out of the limelight. It says, there's no point in showing off what we can do until we've actually done something. Right. Okay. Right. And which has always been my philosophy too. Too. I don't. I don't speak on stages a lot of times as much as some of the other people do. But because I just want to get the science done. Right. And so I what do you on, think about the the twin baby thing then in Ch in uh, China? Oh, fantastic. Okay. I'm. But yeah, they but, gene they but, did gene uh, they, editing. Yeah, on, they gen, did, did gene they, editing using CRISPR to to make a version of a protein to make them so that they're resistant to HIV. Right. Okay. But you know what? I don't believe that's the first. I believe that's the first case of where the parents said to the doctor, you can announce that our you child can, is right. a GMO. Right. Okay. Because pa 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 parents don't want, they, they don't want their kids growing up with everybody picking on them because they're GMOs. Right. So, so they're keeping it secret. But, but actually gene editing and then turning that into a human is so simple. We, we could do that in my lab. Okay. It, it's, it's just, and then, you know, People that I worked with before, like Mike West of BioTime, but he, he spoke at Radfest last year. Yeah, he can do that kind of stuff in his sleep, okay, uh, and he probably wow. has, okay, but he probably doesn't tell anybody right. because it's like it's got such bad, uh, I forget the word, the but, ethical thing yeah. around it and all that. And and but it's so well, people can start freaking out because they start thinking the people are paying God and and they're being unethical and they're not being careful about yeah, these types well, of things. it's going to happen. I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, just, how do you happen. think like 20 years from now, this is just, it's just going to be the norm? Yeah. I mean, like no different than everybody Absolutely. carries phones around and walks around. Recombinant DNA research, when that right. first started, the world was terrified. A Silomon right. conference, they, they had this conference, they, they decided to call a moratorium on recombinant DNA research uh, until they could prove it was safe. This devastated me because I was going to graduate school at the time to do uh, recombinant DNA research. Fortunately, I found a outlet to let me do it anyway. But the uh, uh, it's it's just, now it's commonplace. Now recombinant DNA research is done everywhere. Um, I, I believe that gene editing is the way of the future. I I, I, think too, I myself yeah. have a mutation. I, I, I don't want to call it, it's a gene variant. It shouldn't say a mutation. A, a, a gene variant of one of my uh, cholesterol genes hey, called. I'm getting you rubbing here. Oh, because I was rubbing. That's a good here. Let's just put this down here. Is it still coming out good? See, I thought you were just yeah. going out partying somewhere and you just left us Well, he was. And he He's, came back and he noticed was that the mic was it. off. <laughs> there. Okay. Continue. I have a gene variant of a cardiovascular type protein called LP little a. Okay. And 25% of the population has it but it increases your risk of cardiovascular disease a lot. So it's one of the reasons why I'm exceptionally interested in reducing inflammation and things like that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but uh, How'd you find out you had that? Oh, it's every blood test. They, you can get it when you go get regular blood tests. Uh, Boston Heart Lab is my so, favorite. So they look for it or yeah. do they? Okay. It, yeah, they, they, it'll be listed there. Um, but I know how to gene edit to go ahead and mm -hmm. change that. Okay. But the problem with gene editing... You can change that after you. You can change that at this point in your life. Not... Okay, I can change it in my cells. I can take no. cells from my body, culture them in a Petri dish. I can correct that mutation. Okay? <clears throat> the problem is, and nobody has figured this out really yet, is how to deliver the gene editing mechanisms... Back to into the, the body? Your body? No, to all the cells of the to body. To all no, the cells. Okay. So, you, so if you... you so, so you can do things where you gene edit, do gene editing of a cell, and then culture it and put it back in the body, but you're still gonna have your other cells that right. still don't have it. Right. So, so the big, the big uh, breakthrough that's needed in the gene editing world is figuring out a way to deliver it to all the cells, okay? Well, I think that I think that's AAV where gene therapy is probably one of the top places to do, but we're, Sarah Sciences, we're already looking at other things that are better than AAV. We're actually experimenting with different strategies to improve it even more because Sangamo uh, has been doing AAV uh, delivery for, for 10 years, I'd say. Okay. Uh, and uh, they, they still don't have it working as well as it needs to get working to, 
to, for instance, correct my LP little a gene. Okay, um, you know. Um, so how do you think that? How do you think that that will be delivered in the future? What's your What's <clears throat> your? Um, I'm my best guess is that AAV is not going to be uh, powerful enough to do it. Ad AAV is the gene therapy is called really adeno associated virus. It's the thing we're using to deliver the okay. Walmart gene right now. Um, <clears throat> but there's going to be other things coming along, like we're experimenting with different. I hate the word virus, but they're 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 kind right, of working yeah. like viruses that are more efficient, okay, at getting in that getting into cells, less immunogenic, um, and uh, but there's even uh, a lot of people working on different types of nanoparticles. That's what I was just going to ask yeah, you because I heard about that and that they were doing some of that in Israel too, like some kind of nanotechnology that yeah. they were. Oh no, that lots of that. Like it's on. actually biological, right? Like it's actually. See, see, where do you cry? I, I don't think of the nanoparticle approaches as any different than the virus approaches because we're right. not really, we're just taking components of right. a virus, encapsulating, they're encapsulating it with something else that does the exact same thing that right. the virus exactly. do. Um, <clears throat> and so it's all one and the same, but, I, but there's a tense amount of research going on to really improve the system a lot. Uh, I mean, we, we played around with nanoparticles, uh, we used something called uh, Chariot. Uh, a system of delivering genes uh, called Chariot, uh, probably 12 years ago. And we could get it into cells, but it was like so little. I mean, it was like mm. less than one per cell, uh, way under one, less than one per cell will get into the, ce get into the cells. Uh, and it, it just it was, we decided that viral approaches were working better. Here I'm saying the word virus <laughs> again. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, I believe that the nanotech approach is going to way exceed anything the virus can do because humans are smart. We can, right. we can do a lot of things. And you know, right. what, you know what the big obstacle is? Funding. F funding. Everywhere. Right. Of course. Everywhere. Right. People just don't realize it. What do you think it is things. that stops a lot of these really big billionaire type kind of people from wanting to save their own lives and, and invest their money into this because kind of research? Because they think somebody else will. Because they think someone else will. Okay. That's, I think, the big thing. Uh, <clears throat> they're, I, I mean... When, when I first started my company, I had some very, very wealthy people invest. And the first thing they did was ask me to change the name of the company so that none of their friends would know that they invested into a cure aging project. Mm -hmm. okay? Oh, wow. Because it's, like, it's embarrassing. You know, it's like they want to invest into high tech um, right, right. electronics and things like this. But, but, but some, a lot, there, there's, the problem is there's just way too many charlatans in this field of anti-aging. I wanted to ask you about that. What's what's your thoughts on that? Because I because like for me it seems like that there's a lot of companies right now that are kind of like promoting anti-aging and all these things. But how do you how do you find out the ones that are like legit? That's you hard be a to do. That's hard to do. <laughs> well, it's how you how do you, you even define what right? real anti-aging right? is? You got to kind of try to I be a scientist it. in a way. I That's what I mean. It. This is what I do. You know the speak and the. I know I know when they're pulling the wool over your eyes. I, right. Uh, and I, I, I understand the uh, biochemical mechanisms of a lot of these things, and <clears throat> um, I know the differences, major differences between humans and mice. Uh, where did I just speak? I spoke at a conference in uh, Florida, a um, medical conference in Florida, uh, and I went over a lot of details about the differences between humans and mice. And people were blown away to hear these things. Like, like uh, you know, you've heard of the hay flick limit. Uh, right. Human cells grown in a petri dish will s quit dividing and level off. At a certain well, point. mouse cells do the same thing. Okay, but to get to get the mouse cells to actually start growing again, all you got to do is an add an antioxidant. If you add the antioxidant to humans, it has no effect. Wow. Okay? You add telomeres to the mouse, and it has no effect. The length of the telomeres has no effect. You add the telomeres to the humans, and it comes out of it. So it's like. This whole wow. hayflick limit is by two totally unrelated mechanisms. The mouse is, is caused by oxidative stress and mitochondria dysfunction, whereas the humans is caused by telomere shortening. Is now, that like an evolutionary biology thing? Like, why is that? It's oh, okay. who knows. I always say that aging is a recent evolutionary trait. Okay. okay? Because there are so many different mechanisms of aging. Uh, Explain that a little bit more. I've heard you actually say that, and I don't know exactly yeah. what you mean by that, but I think it's I mean, like an important... Aging, I think aging evolved 
as a way to knock off the old, to kill off the old. I, I because, absolutely agree with because that. Because yeah. if the old yeah, were Darwin, around... Yeah, I mean, Mother Nature is brutal. Yeah, like, if, in, in if, that. The, if the old were still around, the young could never compete. Right. Okay? And so this didn't become a problem until populations got large. Okay? <clears throat> so so this, this is like recent, like let's say in the last 100,000 years. Yeah, because people so. weren't killed off by aging. They were killed off by all kinds of other yeah. things. Yeah, right. <laughs> aging wasn't a problem. Suddenly, <laughs> right, right. suddenly we, we started having more, coming more civilized. People started living longer. Evolution had to figure out some other way of getting it. But I don't know if evolution occurred that late in the process. It probably occurred long before we were actually humans. Okay? Right. Um, the, uh, because there's, when you look at the family, uh, the, not the family trees, <laughs> the, uh, 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 what do you call the tree? Where you, the evolutionary, evolutionary family tree. Yeah, the, the tree. The tree. The, uh, it, it's amazing how you see that certain groups of animals age by telomere shortening, and then others don't. Another right. branch doesn't. And some of these branches are really close together, like rodents versus humans. Okay, so, so we, in collaboration with the uh, uh, lab at University of Texas Southwestern, uh, we looked at a whole bunch of different animals uh, and found out that out of like probably 300 different animal species that were looked at, the only ones that aged by telomere shortening were dogs, cats, horses, sheep, pig, and deer, and then non-human primates too, and humans. Uh, oh, wow. It's like the other ones all age by something else or they have no detectable aging. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, here's a recent, why, why does a lobster have no detectable aging at all? Right. Whereas other animals in the sea do have aging. And some of them, their, their aging is like a clock. And it, like, the, the, like trout, they, they lay their eggs and they die a few days later. They just go through rapid aging. What, it's definitely not telomeres. It's not oxidative stress. It's something, something some yeah. program that's inside of some them. Some biological that says, program. Yeah. Kill right, you. Some biological kill you. time you, clock or something. You are and in the way. This isn't a Crazy. situation where you could look at like a lobster and find out in some way what program they're running and well, change us no. to run that program? Is we, that we, like something? We have. Yeah. Okay. Lobsters have telomerase produced in every cell of their body. They have no telomere shortening. And which is also amazing is they get uh, no, no cancer. They rarely get cancer and other diseases. Right. Okay? Lobster's big problem is every time they divide, every year they shed their shell and they get a little bit bigger. And the bigger they get, the harder it is for them to hide right. from octopus. Oh, yeah, they're delicious. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, right. They get eaten. And, and so, so they get eaten but, alive. But tortoises, clams, um, some fish, some birds, um, all these uh, humpback whales, uh, all these animals have been shown to have undetectable aging. Right. Okay. It doesn't mean they don't age. It's just that nobody's seen it yet. No one can figure okay. it out, right? The, and it, none of them have like rings on a tree mm. that you can count. So you have to to know how long somebody's going to live. You got to be there when they're born. And then watch them grow. Wow. And people didn't start doing that until the time of Darwin. Okay, so, so right. we're still watching these, these things. The, there is one exception though. Clams create a new stripe on their shell every year. And so when people started realizing this, they started counting the stripes. And now they found clams that are over 500. Yeah, years old. I, I saw an article on that. Yeah. That's crazy. And, and it's like, uh, it, it's, but you know, they, they had to have more than just shutting, uh, just shutting off telomere shortening. They also had to have a, a solution to the oxidative stress problem. Um, like Richard Cutler, who's a big, big name in uh, the whole field of uh, oxidative stress, he published a lot of stuff many years ago <coughs> showing the amount of antioxidants that are found in different species. And humans have 100 times as much SOD as a mouse does, okay? That's why mice are so susceptible to oxidative stress. That's why, when, that's why antioxidants will triple the lifespan of a mouse but have no, no detectable effect on humans, okay? Because right. we already have tremendous oxidative uh, protection. Oh, um, wow, okay. And, and, but, but that doesn't mean that when we solve the telomere shortening problem, right, there won't be not, other problems. That, that's gonna, we're, we're gonna have to suddenly solve our oxidative stress problem to keep living longer, and that's why I'm so glad people like Aubrey de Grey are doing all this. So thing. do you think the stem cells have something to do with that? I think stem cells have something to do with all of it. Yeah. Okay, stem so cells, it's also, well, how do you define a stem cell? Any cell mm -hmm. that becomes, that divides to become something else is a stem cell. Okay, uh, so, but 
What well, about the ones they say in the um, in the uh, umbilical cords okay, that so aren't that don't become <coughs> anything? They just like get in there and help like the situation or something. When I was listening to Neil Royden speak yeah, about it, well, he's, so, so he's he's working on mesenchymal stem cells. There's also that's it, uh, mesenchymal. Uh, uh, hemopoietic stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells will not produce the blood, blood yeah. related things. So you got it. So really, you need two at least, <clears throat> maybe more. Uh, human embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells, like what Mike West is working with, that that would replace all the mesenchymal stem cell and hemopoietic stem cell stuff. But <clears throat> the um, there's there's questions as to what is when, when when you take stem cells out of your body, culture and make more of them, and then put them back in. What do those stem cells do? Okay, do they just produce cytokines and other chemicals or things like that that cause your cells that are already in your body to suddenly start behaving younger or, or healthier? Or do they actually become part of your body? Okay, um, It's actually been a real difficult thing to show that stem cells actually have become part of your body at all. Well, I know okay. Rodin was saying, and yeah, his thing real. is that they really should be reclassified as like director cells, I think he was saying, or yeah, like no, they, the he, guy would he, rename he, them who even named them yeah. mesochymal because it's not it appears, at least my understanding from, from watching these experts talk about the research that's coming out, is that Neil, they really Neil are director Reardon cells. Is one of the tops. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to know, what your thoughts are on that and what he's doing down there in no. Panama. Surprised? I'm, I'm, I'm depressed that he has to go to Panama to do that. Yeah, right. right. I mean, it, it should be here. I know a lot of doctors. I mean, another really great stem cell doctor is Dr. Joe Perita down in South Florida. Mm -hmm. And he has to go down to Mexico and other places to to do a lot of the work he wants to do. Right. But it's, it's very pioneering. I, I want to get him speaking at Red. Fest. What do you think about, with that, I mean, and being a scientist, I mean, what do you think's going to happen? I mean, what is the landscape for that to change? The world's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I mean, lots of people now are going to other countries. And right. the FDA is allowing them to do their studies in other countries and still get FDA approval. And That's it's just great. getting yeah. more and more. And um, it's eventually going to be, we're going to be just one big world trying to cure disease. Uh, and it doesn't matter, what, like for instance, okay, so let's say you went to uh, uh, Cambodia, okay, mm -hmm. and you did some studies there, probably completely illegal anywhere else in the world, but you cured aging or right. some other, you cured cancer, okay? Is somebody going to say, I'm not going to try your treatment because you did it in Cambodia? Right. Yeah, right. They're going to go to Cambodia to get treated. You right, know? exactly. And, and, and it's so, so that's what the, the world's going to be like that. It's lot, so much easier to go places now than yeah. it used to be. Uh, it's, uh, and kind of like I keep thinking that's probably what's going to happen with the cure for aging. Right. When, you know, there's a lot of like places that, like Jeju Island in South Korea, uh, uh, places in New Zealand, they, they, they are begging me to come work for Okinawa. In Japan, wow! Okay, right. they want me to move my company there, so that they can be the place where aging is cured, right? And get all these people to come right. and get treated, okay? Wow. Um, like Okinawa used to have the uh, reputation of having the oldest living people, and that's not true anymore, right? And now, uh, uh, right? Yeah, Okinawa. Uh, yeah. What's her name? Minister, uh, uh, God, what's that? Mirashira or something like that. Um, uh, Sh Shimagawa, I, I, Sh I can't remember her name, but she's the minister of Okinawa, and she's had me there three times speaking because she wants to bring the tourism back to Okinawa that used to come there just because they wanted to experience the same kind of lifestyle that they're there. Oh, they're, right. And, yeah, and yeah, now yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. true. Now, people keep saying it's because McDonald's came in, but that's not true. Okay, there's so many populations that are exactly like that that don't have McDonald's and have still low lifespans, it's all of them. Oh, they actually got a McDonald's in Okinawa? Oh yeah, there's <laughs> that fast food places in Okinawa. But, Bunch but of them. It's, it's the bottom line, the reason why there's some areas that have longer living populations than others is because of genetic inbreeding, okay? So the, when, you, when people started sequencing the genomes of these populations that called blue zones, they started finding they had less cancer genes and less heart disease genes than than other populations do. And that was just a statistical anomaly. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, wow. That's interesting because I always hear people talk more about the lifestyle choices that are similar. Well, that's, than, I w we all wish it was that yeah. simple, but it's actually not that simple. Um, oh, so and, they actually have a different genetic makeup that yeah. 
that it's, extends their life. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's just it's not they're, 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 it's they're, just the, the, There's enough variation. Yeah. Enough, well, some okay, people map, there have the yeah. same cancer genes that we do, but less right. people have it. Right. Oh, okay. So, as a result, so statistically, people, they yeah, end up. People. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's, well, with that, I mean, I, I, and we can kind of end on this now. I mean, it seems like there's maybe more reasons to be optimistic about the way research is going than pessimistic. Would you say? I mean, what you've seen uh, I, in the last I, ten I, years being a not I mean, just a scientist, but a business owner who has to yeah. go and raise money and yeah, fund right. and everything. And no, I don't find like calling myself a businessman. Well, you I are. Just No, I <laughs> absolutely try not to. I want to stay a scientist. You're a classic scientist. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I've seen too many great scientists go off and become business people and fail, and the companies right. they start fail. I, so even in my very first business plan, I said, I do not want to be president. I want somebody else to be the president. And my investors fought with me over that until one of them agreed to be the president. Okay, and then wow. I was the chief scientific officer. But but in the last like eight years, I've had to become CEO, uh, the CEO because nobody else would. But I want to get back into uh, right. the business. But um, uh, now I, was gonna, I lost my train of thought. Um, we we're just. Is there reasons it. to be more hopeful? I mean, the, the trend of what you're able oh, to yeah, do yeah. as a scientist. No. Okay, so me, Liz Parrish, Aubrey de Grey, several other people. We're all working on ways of bringing in income other ways, right. okay? Because the investment, the investor field is just not interested in it for some reason, okay? We can't figure out why, but, but can we get this point? So I've just spent 10 years without investors trying to put products on the market, okay? Try, I, don't, I don't put the products on the market. I license it to other companies. Right. right. They then sell the products and I get a royalty that funds our research. Right. And that's been growing and growing and growing. And, and before, you know, and I think this sometime in the next few months, maybe even, we are going to be where we are getting more money than we ever got from investors. Okay? Oh, wow. And when we start getting that much money, I'm going to start not investing, but donating money to other right. groups like Liz Parrish and uh, Aubrey de Grey and things like that because I want to cure my aging. Yeah, right. And I know telomeres isn't the only thing we need to do. I need yeah, Aubrey right. to do all his yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's right. a few and things. Liz Parrish has a whole bunch of things going on that are. What super are all exciting. these tech companies doing with their money? Because I thought all these tech companies are supposed to be they're, putting they're, all this money okay. to. So that's a whole different subject. Okay, they're, we're gonna have to talk no, about no, that no, next no, time no, come I, because I, just, I wonder I just, that because you hear about these companies. Yeah, right. You hear how they're. I guess and Google and, and all these aging and all this stuff, and you don't really see like it's. I don't want to call it the charlatan aspect of it, but it's the entertainer aspect of it okay mm, okay so so there's a lot of people out there that have no background in aging but they're great entertainers they get on stage and they put on a really great show and everybody thinks they're great well these high-tech companies with these billionaires that really don't understand aging they're hiring these people they're getting these people involved and have they cured aging yet no with all that money shoot why haven't they cured aging yet it's because wow they're, right they're not paying attention to the real science because they don't have the ability to, okay? They're, they, they're relying on these entertainers, which I call them, to, to really populate the thing. And, and I don't, I'm, I'm unfortunately become an entertainer. You call me a celebrity at the beginning. I don't like that you know, idea, but right. it is, I, by necessity, I've become an entertainer just because I need to let the world know. And now it's mostly what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to let the world know that we have discovered things that other companies have licensed and they're trying to now sell them. They're trying to sell them right now and these things are the best things on the planet to work yeah. with. And it, plus it gives us a royalty. So yeah. then finding anybody buys some, they can feel like they're contributing to more research. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, unfortunately I have had to become an entertainer but I look forward to the day when I am going to every day wake up, go to work, put my lab coat on mm -hmm. and not think about anything else except the science. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. That's the way I was before 2008, and that's the way I'm going to awesome. be again soon. Well, thank you for Perfect. doing what thank yeah, you yeah, very thank much. Thank you so much. Awesome. Promise awesome. you'll be back. Yeah. Right, we got lots to talk about. Lots. I'm going to come back a lot. All right.